I'm Jeff Jarvis from the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY, and I am thrilled that I get to have a conversation with Nathan Allebach, who is the man behind the Stakeums Twitter account that has taken uh, Twitter in the COVID world by storm. And the reason I wanted to talk so much to Nathan is because with my colleague, Kerry Brown, at the Newmark School, we started a degree in social journalism, which is not just about social media, it's about interacting with and listening to communities. And I was so impressed with what Nathan did with Twitter, the tool of social media, and the odd platform of the brand, that I wanted to talk to him from his perspective about lessons for, I think, for journalists and for our students and other journalists about how to uh, interact with the community these days, how to have credibility and such. So that's my intro, Nathan. Thank you for doing this, I'm grateful. Yeah, oh yeah, I really appreciate it, Jeff. It should be fun. So, um, I, 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 I'm sure you've told the origin story a hundred times, but can you start there with, with um, how you turned the Stakeums account into a voice of reason and rationality in an otherwise insane time? <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's very strange hearing it out loud. Never, it, never gets, uh, it, never gets, it never feels like a, um, like a normal thing to hear it out loud, I'll say that. I guess it started a couple of years ago, the eight, the family agency I, I represent, you know, we had been kind of working with the Stakem uh, Twitter voice as this uh, driving platform for the brand as a way to kind of uh, reinvent it. Because I mean, for those who know what Stakem is, as a, as a frozen meat product that was popular in like the 1970s and the 1980s, um, among other similar legacy brands, you know, in today's era, it just needed to reinvent itself in some way and marketing in the marketing sense. So uh, the past couple of years, you know, we've been working to, in figuring out new ways to kind of get it relevant again, you know, to get uh, younger people specifically talking about it and to just like give it some kind of brand identity that, that kind of went beyond, you know, what people had traditionally thought of when they heard of the name Steak and were saw its advertising. So this, this whole thing, uh, it's a long, long story of just how we got involved with Twitter, but specifically with this whole um, this whole voice of reason thing. We were, it basically started toward the beginning of the virus. And when, you know, if you spend any number of, of uh, days of the week on Twitter, you notice just the constant influx of trends and the news and um, things just move at such a rapid pace. And we were just noticing, you know, the conversations were getting more and more uh, dreadful, I guess I would, I would frame it as. It's just more and more um, angst, you know, online where people are just getting more nervous about the, uh, the kind of oncoming effects of the virus as it kind of spread around the world. And uh, we were just like, I guess at first taken aback because we were trying to figure out like, okay, as a, as a frozen meat brand that um, operates as a for-profit basis, you know, it's, we're not really it, at any point um, in authority per se to like interject ourselves in, in, this, in the same way that other maybe media brands or uh, more like... Um, like journalistic institutions or or medical and scientific communities would be in, in a place to you know kind of speak as an authority like you like you framed it as you know to this whole the pandemic and this whole like outbreak of misinformation we didn't really know how to position ourselves at first so we just spent a lot of time listening to conversations and kind of seeing what was what we thought was missing from these conversations and then just figured out you know we're just have to, gonna have to take a chance here because it's either one we completely sit on the sidelines and say nothing, which is honestly a, a good strategy for a lot of brands because most people are, are kind of fed up with what brands are trying to like insert themselves into this conversation right now. It's not really a, a time for advertising as we all, we've all figured out. But um, we just didn't think that that was best because we've done this type of like interjection and cultural commentary in years prior. So we kind of had some, uh, some clout as, uh, as they say to um, be able to insert ourselves in, in, a, in a way that just felt like, you know, the, like the brand we had been building on Twitter, which is this kind of unifying voice, you know, cultural criticism, but done through more nuance and, and uh, understanding. So just, it, it, it kind of just fell in our laps. Like it wasn't like a, it wasn't intentional in the sense that we didn't think it would go viral, obviously, like the way it did. It was just more like, hey, these are some things that aren't being said or talked about enough on Twitter and just online in general. How can we uh, provoke thought and bring people together while doing it? So that's kind of how it, the, the seed got started. So I want to virtually hug you for starting out with listening. Um, 
the social journalism program we started is all about some teaching journalists to listen because we're not very good at listening, to be honest. We listen for quotes, we listen for the things we want to put in our stories, but we're not good at truly listening. And we have a program in entrepreneurial journalism where I also teach, it's about listening. And you come from marketing. And you would think that a marketer's first job is to speak, is to have a message, is to get stuff across. So tell me a little bit about how you practice the skill of listening and how you did that in this case. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question because you're right. I mean, marketers in general, they tend to uh, exist in what I would kind of call this the silo of analytics where mm -hmm. marketers tend to use a lot of uh, third party tools and ways to track, you know, their audiences and how to, you know, directly um, advertise to their, their consumer base. And it's very, um, you know, it's very numbers driven in most cases, especially in, in today's era. But for us, I mean, through the Twitter account with Stake, I mean, you know, we really, for better or worse, I mean, some people hate that we've done it this way. Some people are obviously fans of it, but um, we've built the uh, the brand on Twitter through um, various communities that we've um, just basically played a, played a part in in some way over time. I mean, we've basically, um, depending on, I'm trying to think how to phrase this, like something might come up, say, in uh, like media circles, like some topic on a given day. And Stakem, the brand on Twitter, will just kind of jump in it and like insert itself. And then over time, as it does that, you know, it kind of becomes like a namesake in these smaller communities. And through doing that over like dozens of communities over the past three years, I've just, um, through the account, like we follow a pretty wide range of uh, different accounts and for a wide range of communities. And I make sure, you know, that the sort of trending stuff that we're seeing is varied because obviously like the... Twitter and any web and any social media platform will give you like a tailored algorithm of like of trends that it thinks you want to see. So we'll try to like mix that up as much as we can. So it doesn't like stay siloed in any one direction. So it's more just like, it has to be more than a, um, a marketing tool. It has to be like actually participated in the culture, which is something that like me personally, um, among my coworkers as well, you know, we spend a lot of time just like reading the news and following various online communities and actually participating in these discussions so that we feel like we have at least some semblance of understanding of uh, what's going on in the conversations that are being had so that when we insert ourselves, it's not just like clearly out of left field and clearly, you know, an outsider perspective. It kind of feels more integrated and, uh, and familiar from, from those uh, who are in those communities. You know what I mean? So I want to come back to communities, but I still want to push you a little bit more on what you were listening for. Um, what it is that maybe you wanted to, because I, I hear you that you had, you saw that moment where you could react, but you also said earlier, mm -hmm. you saw what was missing in the conversation. Was, was it just rationality and that was your opening? What was missing? I would, yeah, yes. And I would say, this is a tough one because I would say the biggest problem, so there's two, actually, there's, I don't, I don't even want to frame it as the biggest problem because there's so many big problems, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, specifically with what we were seeing on Twitter. So like right away, I mean, and I'm sure everybody else can attest to this within the first month of the pandemic, um, kind of like hitting the, particularly the U.S. Uh, media mainstream, there was an immediate uh, politicization and polarization of the virus. Like it was just right. Right away, um, it seemed like there was a large sex of uh, both political parties that had like, you know, their strong takes on it and they were just colliding. And it was just a, there was no, there was no um, centralized media narrative that people were following. And then maybe you had some dissenters on each side. It was pretty like broad um, subcultures that were like really at odds with each other. So that was like the first thing we noticed. But then obviously with that, there came like the waves of misinformation then because of that breakaway from like a mainstream narrative that everybody could agree upon all these people were kind of coming to the table with like various conspiracy videos on youtube and blogs that you've never heard of that have no citations or, or authors and um you're seeing this stuff get spread around like virally and there was so those are the two main problems so like with that because it is politicized i i know personally like from my own you know biases and perspectives when I look at the the people that I've known personally, like in my life, that would share more of like the conspiratorial uh, misinformation that's been going around, I have to think like, why are they doing that? Like, what is their motivation? What is the the cause that is driving them to this? 
And a lot of it is just media literacy. A lot of it is, you know, uh, powerful people and institutions taking advantage of, uh, of those in this time of misinformation because it's a time of panic. So like people are more vulnerable to it. And um, so, so for me, like just generally speaking, like when we were um, just all kind of coming together and listening for this stuff, the big thing is like, okay, we all see that it's uh, politicized, but how can we speak to the problem in a way that like is direct and addressing like misinformation and all that, but is also being empathetic and trying to be understanding to why that's happening. And a lot of that is just like asking questions. A lot of that's phrasing things in a broad unifying sense. Um, but that was like the general gist of what I think was missing. And part of the reason why I think, and I've, I've said this and many others have said this since then, part of the reason why Stakem as a brand kind of went viral and people were attracted to it in this way is because if you heard the same exact messaging from any one, say, say it was like, I don't know, like Chris Hayes on the left or like Tucker Carlson on the right, it would never have the same resonating effect because of like their pre-existing prejudices and biases and their, and their standing in the media landscape. It's the fact that it came from a random frozen meat brand that it kind of like brought people together because it was like, oh, like we all know Stakem's motivations are to sell frozen meat, not to like, you know, push a certain political or media based agenda. So that was kind of our, you know, our initial thoughts coming into that, this whole space of what needed to be said and why no maybe not nobody but few other people were uh, speaking to these these things it was that moment we're saying even a frozen meat brand has more sense than this has right <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah yeah which is kind of beautiful um tell me more about community because i i didn't know that that's how you approached it that you 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 enter yourself into multiple communities and again this i'm going to go back and plug my social journalism program applications will be reopened very soon um that um we go to communities that are self-defined, not that are externally defined. And marketers are really big on defining people with fake names and demographics and all kinds of things. On social media, you don't see that. So how does, you have a different relationship to community. Talk about that for a minute. Yeah, sure. So like specifically on Twitter, um, people who are like a really deep into Twitter and the, and, and the various subcultures within it can kind of tell you that the way it's made up is like there is like there is the sort of unified body of Twitter, which is the the body of Twitter that follows all of the top trending um, topics each day that are just kind of like whether they're national or international, like say some major uh, political event happens that day or there's some like new movie that just came out. And then like those are the topics that just all the sort of subcultures within Twitter will jump on because they're hot topics of the day. But like broken down within those main topics, you have like all these different subcultures that they, I, people tend to refer to whatever the name of it is um, prior to the name Twitter. So they'll say like brand Twitter is a subculture, which is like all of the brands like like Stakem or Wendy's or Moon Pie. So that would be like brand Twitter as a subculture. Um, there's library Twitter, which is like a, a Twitter subculture made up of librarians and book lovers and and actual like library institutions like the libraries themselves or other nonprofits based around uh, books. And then you have other ones like uh, like media Twitter, which is a lot of like the, the journalists that obviously are reporting on this stuff. Um, there's weird Twitter, which is like a, a ironic, I, I would define it as an ironic shit posting anti-capitalist group of trolls. Um, <laughs> it's like they're they're kind of it's kind of a complex group like if if you google weird twitter you can find um various like histories and um analysis of how it kind of came to be but it's a very unique group of users who kind of like formed a lot of the early culture of twitter as far as like it's ironic absurdist humor and they still have like a, a pretty prominent um political influence i would say on the platform to this day so especially, especially, especially this day with um, the 2016 election with, with Bernie Sanders running, they kind of like really earned like a, a lot more a media clout through that. But there's all these different subcultures. And over time for us, we, like I said earlier on, like we've just kind of been exploring them as time goes on. Like even in recent years, uh, like some of the more recent ones that I, I've spent more time in personally has been like Stan Twitter, which is like, this massive like and then within stan twitter there's all these like subsets of like various uh people that that these groups quote unquote stan or like worship slash follow obsessively um like a lot of it's around k-pop groups or uh 
certain YouTubers like Shane Dawson or certain uh, musicians like Justin Bieber or Ariana Grande. And these are like massive, massive, massive subcultures of people. And they all have like their own language and like this, they, they'll often um, brigade uh, certain hashtags to like, it, like kind of artificially force trends in, in the trending tab. So anyway, um, these are all just things that I've just been interested in personally. And so have my coworkers over the past few years. And we just like stumble upon them it's either accidentally or maybe we'll seek them out and we just get to know the various people within these communities. I mean, through whatever limited means that we have. And it just helps us understand the language and the influence and their views and where they're coming and how they just generally influence uh, Twitter as a platform. So um, that's been something that as a brand, like from a marketing perspective, obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously we, we want to tap into like as many markets as we can. So like, we'll kind of experiment with like which markets or which subcultures could be potential markets for the brand. And even the ones that aren't like, just like cause a lot of these are just like, they're made up of people not even based in the U S. So like even the ones that aren't based in the U S like, it's just fun to get to know them, to understand where they're coming from. And they obviously cross pollinate with other subcultures that might be relevant to our market or our brand. So it's all just, um, it's all a matter of interest and in being able to kind of like, spread spread into these various subcultures to understand like what makes up twitter as a whole which is really complicated and, and so when you you look at at, at library and twitter or k-pop twitter mm -hmm. are you asking what do they want what can i contribute what's my place how, how do you place yourself on them yeah sure no it typically starts so like um on my own or like on i should say on stakem's own uh, twitter feed there, you know, people will be retweeting things, liking things, and, and it'll, it'll just pop up in the news feed. Once in a while, there might be a tweet that pops up, and I've never seen the creator, but like the, the, the account before, and I've never seen, you know, the subculture it originated from. So I'm, I get curious, jump into that, maybe interact through the brand. And then oftentimes, like especially with um, like certain like st stan oriented communities, because they have such rabid and uh, active fan bases if like a new account interacts with one of their like favorite people or whatever, they um, get super excited and also confused because they, they're all pretty like regular. Like a lot of these accounts, when they tweet, it's the same, say like 50,000 people that interact with it every day, you know? So like when a new account interacts with it, they're all just like, what, what the heck? Like, who's this, <laughs> who's this account? Yeah. So like when it's stake them, it obviously like presents a whole other <laughs> layer of just like, why is this frozen meat brand interacting with our favorite YouTuber or favorite musician or whatever. So, um, it, sometimes it starts with that. Like I'll just tweet at one of these, these big accounts, like in the middle of something trending. Other times I'll seek them out through hashtags and then doing that a lot of times these group members will literally just start DMing the account, oftentimes adding us to group chats. So we'll be in like a group chat of 50 other people that are all within that community. And they'll just like constantly be talking about whatever topic they're obsessed with that day. And we'll, we'll just chime in and just be like, what's going on in this group chat? What do you guys do? And just kind of just chat with them. Like it's nothing, we're not like asking, you know, like marketing targeted questions. It's more yeah. just like, how can we understand more about this community? You're building you know? a relationship. Yeah. In yeah. Short. In some weird convoluted sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, uh, any mention of, of marketing executives, you know, brings up either stiff white shirts or too cool uh, clothes, uh, in a conference room. Um, and I know you've probably been asked this a million times too. What's the reaction of the folks who pay you or the folks at Stakeums? Um, what did it take to convince them? I mean, granted, you already had a, a voice you were building, mm -hmm. but you come toward so many other marketers, so many other advertisers have run away from COVID. One of the, of the scandals I think right now is that COVID, coronavirus, and those words are on advertisers' forbid lists, and they don't want to be anywhere near it, and you ran toward it. Um, <laughs> God bless you. So what was the reaction uh, at your version of corporate? And, and, and how do you manage that in all this? Yeah, oh, it's, it's so, yeah, it's a maze just trying to like navigate um, to the trust in that relationship. Because like you, you mentioned, I mean, this has obviously been years. This is, this is on, as of August, this will be three years since we've been managing the Twitter account the way we have. So, I mean, from that point to now, it's been a gradual build of trust between them, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then we've gotten 
much more freedom in some ways. And, and along the way, we've hit certain points where, you know, we, we, we hit up, we run up against a guardrail and they're like, okay, no more talking about this, no more doing this. We kind of, you know, recalibrate, you know, like where we, the brand should be like for, for all the, for all the, the interests of all the parties involved. And um, with this, like I mentioned before, I mean, we had been um, inserting ourselves in kind of cultural commentary and criticism just in years prior, like just, it's all like, for people on the outside, I mean, it's weird because it's like part of it is ironic for the fact that it's coming from a frozen meat brand. But then part of it is also like a familiarity and like a, a sense of like we can all kind of come together because it's a frozen meat brand and because it's not like a pundit or a politician that that's the one saying this. So kind of like a weird thing that we've been able to tap into that I think is pretty much almost completely unique to stake. I mean, I don't really, I've seen other similar brands do similar things, but not nearly to the degree we have. And that degree is largely formed because of this trust relationship with the client. And this, this whole thing, um, I mean, obviously, like I mentioned before, we didn't plan for it to go viral. So when it did go viral and we were getting all this positive sentiment, like which happened literally overnight, and there was like a bunch of articles that were getting written up the next day when, when the first uh, thread went viral, you know, the people at corporate, they're happy, obviously, because they're like, oh, cool. Like, you know, <laughs> we're being talked about in like a positive, positive light. But obviously, like along the way with that and how we've, we've kind of stewarded the conversation, it's still been a pretty, um, a pretty, uh, not volatile, but like, you know, we're kind of walking a, a thin line. Like you mentioned, right. like a lot of advertisers are running from this topic. So we're still having to really be careful as to how we approach it. Like, I'm like if I'm writing a series of tweets about this whole thing, I might start with a topic and be like, okay, this topic looks good on paper and I think it'll, it'll go over well and then get like three tweets into it and then realize, man, like what if like this, this uh, opinion kind of gets implicated from what I'm saying and, and they take it the wrong way. And like, so there's just a lot of like little things that obviously the client was concerned about um, rightfully so, because this whole thing, all it would take is like one tweet where like it's seen as Stakem is like overstepping into right. the territory it just shouldn't be talking about you know like it's it's all incredibly vague and being like thought up on the fly so yeah there was definitely some nerves but no like this again we like you mentioned like we wouldn't most brands don't have even close to the uh, the trust relationship that we have with this client and that trust has only come from years of like proving over and over again why like we can we can manage this, uh, this like chaotic world. <laughs> what I also love about the way you've handled this is the honesty of it is, is reminding people, Hey, I'm just, I'm just a, a brand. I'm just trying to sell frozen meat products. Mm -hmm. I, I, I am what I am. Um, and, and, but I also imagine that has to be confusing for you personally at some level, because you know, when you come on, are you speaking as Nathan? Are you speaking as stakes? And how, how do you, um, but you want to be honest. You want to be transparent. You want to be authentic. Right. Um, so you're authentic as you and you're as authentic as a cheesesteak. How do you pull that off personally? Yeah, it's become kind of an impossible, um, I guess, uh, like paradox, you could say. Because in the beginning, when this whole thing started, I had no personal intention of, of putting, like attaching my name to this stuff at all. Because obviously, I work within an agency framework, which mm -hmm. is connected to the client framework. And there's a lot of moving pieces like i'm just maybe the, i'm just the person directly behind the account which is you know on top of all these other layers of branding and, and uh like internal team members so when this whole thing started and like uh, a lot of the interviews are being conducted and like we're we're such a small agency like we're only 20 person agencies so like my name got attached to it pretty quick just based on you know like there's not like a whole lot it's not like we're a 500 person you know madison avenue agency where you could kind of just like cover it up vaguely and be like oh it's just one of our copywriters or one of our social people out of dozens so um it's been very strange because i had no, like i said i had no intention of being like a public figure with this and now inevitably if i do an interview like this or any interview for that matter um whatever i say could potentially be you know traced back to the brand and then people could be like correlating you know whatever like i'm saying as a, as a person I mean, my own personal views biases opinion like opinions on matters could be then saying like oh well now it's stakem who has these opinions and biases and, and and whatever so that that part of it's been really difficult to navigate for everybody involved because obviously you know stakem as an entity it's the one it's the thing that is uh behind 
all of this. I mean, like obviously me personally, if I was just shouting my thoughts into the void, very few people would care. Like I don't have a, like now I, now I have more of a platform, but especially when I started on that account, I mean, I was not like an active person on social media. I wasn't trying to build a, like a profile for myself. So it's, um, it is very bizarre and it can be kind of tumultuous just because like I said, I mean, Stakeum is an entity that is a brand and I am a person, but like I've been now been directly associated with that brand in a way that it's, it's kind of like the genies out of the bottle. So I have to be like really careful in just like anything I tweet, anything I say in interviews. And that's a, it's a shame because obviously, you know, I wish there was more separation and I think it could get built up again as time goes on, but especially in like the aftermath of these, um, these viral moments where there's like that direct one-to-one, like, Oh, here's a wall street journal interview where it's talking about the Stakem Twitter account. And then it says right there, like, here's the person behind the Stakem Twitter account. And, um, that's something that I think in hindsight, we probably would have tried to like shape differently, but it's tough. Cause like I said, it's not like we have a team of six or seven people. It's just me. So that, that's all yeah, part I, of the, I the think, transparency. I think if you hadn't been there, it might've been seen as manipulative. Yeah, exactly. Cause that's the, like you mentioned the transparency thing, like with this whole thing from the beginning, all of us, like the whole, our marketing team, the people at stake, and we've all been in agreement that we want to just like, whenever people are asking for interviews or anything, we're just telling people what, what went on. Like there's mm-hmm. no grand master scheme. Like you mentioned, like the white suits behind or the, the you know, the dark suits and the closed doors, um, you know, which is what people generally think of these marketing strategies. That just wasn't the case with this. I mean, there's a lot of us just messing around and having fun and trying new things. And it all just kind of ha- unfolded by chance and by, you know, just us getting, being in the right place at the right time. So there's definitely, I, I I'm, I'm grateful that we've been able to be that transparent, but obviously with transparency comes responsibilities. So. Yeah, and, and a chill on you personally. Uh, yeah. Hear yeah, that too. Totally. There may be yeah. things you want to say, but you realize you can't right now unless you have yep. a third alter ego and then you don't get the no. house confused. <laughs> yeah. Nope. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a, uh, it is, it's very difficult to navigate and, and I'm used to, like I said, I've adjusted. I'm used to it at this point, but it is, it is a shame because there are obviously circumstances where I'm like, I wish I could just go off about all these various topics, but I need to like restrain myself in a way. And it's not even just like, even if I didn't, wasn't this closely represented to the brand, just generally speaking in like media and advertising these industries, like there is a lot of um, like a touchy, like you're like, Oh, you got to watch because like your future employer might be looking like you're, you know, your competition might be looking, there might be peers that you could offend. Like there's all these strange relationships you have to navigate within our industries just to make sure you're not like a liability to any companies. So there's already that pressure. And then this just adds like another layer of, uh, of trying to be a certain way, you know? It's something journalists struggle with too. I mean, I, I used to be a columnist, now I'm a blogger and I have tenure, so screw it. I can say what I want to. Um, <laughs> Uh, but for, if you're a student, if you're new in the field, if you're working for a public publication, that's hard. Um, uh, so in praise to you, the average schmo couldn't pull off what you're doing, right? It's smart. What did you study? <laughs> um, I, I tell people that I'm just an autodidact uh, liberal arts major. <laughs> I did not... <laughs> Pretty, pretty much all, all of what I know has come from self-interest. I mean, like I definitely taking uh, like a range of liberal studies courses in college. I mean, ranging from sociology, philosophy, psychology, you know, history and all, and all the rest. I mean, obviously I got like a, a baseline in a lot of these topics that help shape certain parts of my views. But most of it has come from just spending a lot of time online, you know, listening to various podcasts and YouTube shows and reading various media publications and just following topics through like through different through lines in my life as I've kind of like shifted ideologically over time. And then like my interests will shift with that. So I mean, like when I was younger, I was a lot more conservative. I grew up in a more conservative uh, community. And as I got older, I kind of rejected that went the other way went pretty progressive. And then as I got a little older, then I kind of like pulled back toward the center a little bit. And then I pulled back toward the left a little bit. I've, got, I've had like a bunch of these shifts, both um, religiously and politically and just culturally. And um, along the way, I, I've taken it seriously. It was never just like, 
oh, this is like the people I'm around. This is what they think. So now it's what I think. Like it's always been a personal interest to seek out information within these ideologies. So I think uh, for me, it's always been, like I said, self-interested and uh, over time, just kind of learning, learning um, just how to navigate uh, my sources and, and where I derive my views from. Um, this is a dumb question. That's what we do for a living. Um, do you like the internet? Are you a fan of the internet? Uh, in a time of tech clash, uh, what's your view about the net as a whole? It's, I mean, it's, uh, I, I, I wouldn't attribute good or bad nature to the inter internet, but obviously it's a tool like anything else that is be currently being used for, um, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would posit it's being used for more bad than good right now in the middle of a tragedy, in the middle of a crisis, because we just don't have, we don't have the unifying regulations or literacy within um, across the world and across the country to really make the internet a more net good in a time like this. Like I think if, if you think about like just my, even my generation, like I was one of the, I'm 28 years old. So I was one of the first generations that grew up with the internet through my school career. So as like my teachers are teaching me, you know, how to, you know, use like, like the Google or like surf on certain websites and media literacy and all that, they're literally learning about this while they're teaching me. Like it's right. brand new, you know? So like, I just think it's been too short a time and there's not a lot, there hasn't been enough um, like uh, guardrails and, and uh, universal regulation and, and education and understanding around how to use the internet for everybody. And now that it's like, so universally accessible without all that like without those things just kind of like safeguarding it it's really hard to, to uh, put the genie back in the bottle because i think for anybody especially who's even my age like people that are well out of high school well out of college and then older and we all have access to the internet like how do you teach masses of people how to think critically with media literacy and even if you can teach them that how do you like get them to spend enough of their free time willingly to like learn about these things. It's one thing to know how to like, you know, work your way around Google. It's another thing to understand, you know, the biases and the motivations behind, you know, the, the thousands and thousands of sources out there that you're going to stumble upon. So it's just really, I think right now it's, it's bad, obviously, but um, it all kind of just depends on how you use the internet. It definitely, it, I'll, I'll put it this way. It has a tendency to favor extremism in all forms and that is bad and if there's a way to combat that the internet will provide it hopefully but right now it is just not promising you see <laughs> that's that's why i like what you do because you are from the left field a mechanism to combat that right you you brought rationality into a discussion that as you said was was filled with fear i, I i'm just reading and it's not doesn't it's not a short read um uh uh, Aeropagetica, I'm mispronouncing it, I'm sure, John Milton's 1644 mm -hmm. talk to Parliament uh, against the licensing of printing. Wow. And, and what he's saying in there is, at the end, if you, if you try to license what's good and bad, then you're not trusting the people. And by the way, it's an impossible task. Right. So at some level, you have to, you have to trust the people um, to do that. And I also just read Franklin... Uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin's uh, apology for printing uh, when he started printing the paper and people would get mad at him for having opinions they didn't like and he said well so then you're going to end up with just the things I like and that's no good <laughs> so, so the two things that give me hope in this are you and science and so I, I started a Twitter uh, list of COVID experts epidemiologists, mm -hmm. virologists and so on 600 some or 500 some of them and it is phenomenal to watch the scientists talk with each other and uh, give peer review to papers and, 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 and be open to discussing things with the public. They do it as science. Now, we in media do a bad job of, of reporting on science, I think. We don't understand the process of it. But that gives me hope. You give me hope and they give me hope. A, a frozen meat product and <laughs> uh, epidemiology give me hope together. You know, so I, I think it's there. I think we're figuring it out. It's still new. It's still young. Yeah, no, I 100% I agree. It's just, it's very, it's very difficult terrain to navigate. And I think yeah. the deeper people dig into it, this is the big problem I find whenever I converse with people who are down the conspiracy rabbit hole is that what you find is, is that like with this whole COVID-19 fiasco, as far as like the misinformation age reoccurring now, 
it's not like all these people just stumbled upon conspiracies for the first time and they were like, oh, I'm hooked. I mean, a lot of this has been embedded and like growing in the culture for decades now. And that split, like that polarizing split, like I mentioned, the sort of um, a lot of this is it's you could date it back to you know you could date it back as far as the 50s even before that but i mean especially like in contemporary media the past like 50 70 years i mean there's just a lot that goes in to um understanding you know why there's a large large subsect of people out there who just don't trust our institutions and it's like the only way to fix that and the only way to uh to work toward better education is to understand the why behind you know these people's skepticism and then address that, you know, at its root, because I think when you're fighting this constant information war on the surface, where like some, uh, you know, m like misinformation blog comes out, and then you're trying to combat it with a, like a like a better information blog to kind of show like this is where all these you know facts are wrong. That that obviously does its own set of good, but it doesn't get to the root where there's like a, like a fundamental distrust there for a lot of these people and it's, it's very cultural. And I think that's so I definitely have hope, but it's, I think it's deeper than most people right now are recognizing or can recognize. Cause like, like I said, you're fighting misinformation on the front lines right now. So it's kind of hard to be like here, we got to fight this misinformation and then also do these deep dives to provide like contextual analysis of why that misinformation is so appealing. It's like a multi-layered uh, issue, you know? Well, and I, and I hear you having gone your personal journey through political religious views gave you the opportunity perhaps to be more empathetic and, and understand and that, and that empathy is especially hard to do these days. You know, I've told students in social journalism how they have to empathize with some communities and some of them say, no, why should I? I, I you know, my, my, my community is attacked by their community and I, and I empathize with that view. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard. And, and, and so, you you're in a position where you can't call somebody an idiot um <laughs> uh, even even though you come across them so so you're also um so from your personal life which is now exposed uh you're on twitch you love dogs uh, what's the rest of your i mean outside of covid before this happened what's the rest of your job and and, and day like I'm not going to lie. I mean, literally my, at this point in my life, I'm just a nerd. I mean, my interest is this stuff. Like I'm obsessed <laughs> with, uh, just like, like different, you know, culture wars and, and misinformation and trying to understand, you know, why people disagree about things. I mean, this is just the, the politics and the culture of it all is like my number one interest. I spent a lot of time reading and studying about this. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I'm day to day. I, I, our agency does a lot of different works. I mean, like the, the Stakem account is obviously my main focus, but then I also do a range of other work for um, like so, some within the agency and some freelance uh, on the side. I do, I do, I shouldn't say the platform. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say. I do work for like a, one of the major tech platforms as like a creative consultant. And um, I also do other brand rep work and I do other consulting for like local small businesses and like and and uh, entrepreneurs and people like that so pretty much almost all of my day at this point is tied to my devices unfortunately like it's kind of a around the clock thing <laughs> if you hadn't done this for a living what would you have done I growing up I, I always wanted to be a songwriter and I always wanted to get involved in some type of nonprofit work um, when I was in high school like my senior project in high school, I was convinced that I was after I graduated, I was going to like go to the Congo and like fight against, you know, like the, uh, the regime, the military regimes there that were working with child soldiers and all that. Like I was really obsessed with like that type of activism growing up. And then as I got older, I was realizing just like the immense complexity of all that and just how it probably wasn't my role, at least, at least that's the way I saw it at the time. Like maybe this isn't the best thing for me. But um, I was always an artist growing up. I mean, songwriting was my number one thing. And as soon as I met my now wife uh, about, well, we'd known each other for about 10 years, but we really started getting together about five years ago. Um, right, right around that time, I was realizing, like, if I ever want to have a serious relationship and uh, settle down one day, I probably need... <laughs> I need to job. like, yeah, I need to refocus. Um, cause I, I was, you know, I was making like a little, I was doing like restaurant and bar gigs and like pe playing people's weddings and that type of thing. But I, um, it was music burned more of a hole in my wallet than it ever made me. I mean, it's just the cost of recording and buying new yep. equipment and all that. And I was, it is one day I, I was probably like 24 or 23 and I was just like, okay, 
I've been trying this for like 10 years. I need to, you know, replace this creative outlet with one that is potentially going to make me more money. <laughs> so last question, I think that might be a lie. Um, what do you think of, because I'm trying to tie together what you do and what journalists do in, mm -hmm. in, in this odd world. Um, what do you think of generally of the media coverage you're seeing in this crisis? Oh man, <laughs> I think I, I mean, it's a mixed bag, man. I mean, you know, as well as I know, like there's so many differences in types of media coverage. Like I think the, to me, the biggest, biggest problem um, has with the media coverage so far has been the sort of, and it's not necessarily the media's fault per se, but it's the sort of blurring of the lines between reporting and then um like actual like journalism like like the writing up and like the fact checking of certain events because i think like throughout the virus because it's changed so frequently a lot of times like whether it's you know cnn or msnbc or fox or even like some of the the, the more um like you know traditional institutions like the new york times like they'll be writing stories as events unfold but then like the next week there's some contradictory evidence or something that happened that they missed and then because of that, because of how fast paced it's been moving, the people that are on whatever opposing side politically or culturally point to those errors and are like, look, this is, you know, whether it's fake news or they'll just say like that they've been lying to us, you know, like the, the media doesn't have our best interests at heart. And I think just that like misunderstanding between like, you know, boots on the ground reporting on a 24 seven basis and then the actual like. Um, and then, and I, I maybe throw op-eds on top of that versus like, you know, the, the more reviewed editorialized, uh, pieces that actually, you know, take a lot of time to get put out and they're fact checked and it's, it's solid. I think just the miscommunication and understanding between those things for the general public in the midst of all this has been a huge, huge problem. So I've, I've, a lot of the reporting I've seen hasn't been bad. It's just the fact that like things are changing so fast and there's not like, like I mentioned before, there's not a unifying narrative. So it's just so, so easy between like sort of the, the traditional like establishment media companies and then these more newer like independent digital companies. And they can constantly be like contradicting each other. And like it just leads to the sort of uh, the viral conspiracy nature of a lot of the misinformation out there to be like, look at these headlines from CNN or look at this you know, quote in the New York Times, like they said this thing, but then, or even like the WHO or CDC, like they said this thing months ago, but now they're saying this thing. And I just think um, it, the media has struggled a lot with trying to like reestablish some semblance of like, this is what our reporters are doing, like with their boots on the ground. This is what like our, you know, editorialized pieces are trying to do, like to like disseminate, you know, what's been happening and try to like source it and fact check it and all that. And um, so I, I don't, I, if I had to give them a grade, I don't know. I, it, there's just, there's too many, like, I think some publications have done a really good job. Some have done a really bad job. Um, but just generally speaking, like, I think even on the left side of the political spectrum, I would say that the public has a, a degraded trust in media through all this, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, and it sucks because like I said, I don't think all of it is the media's fault. It's just more like a, perception thing and a failure to like educate you know and i don't even know if that's the media's job necessarily it's just that that perception that people have of like you know here's this headline and here's this report from a week ago and now it's being contradicted or changed and what can you really trust like a, that's a sentiment i see on every platform from people who are like kind of like pseudo skeptics they'll be like well you can't trust anyone and it's like okay well that then you're basically you're not saying anything if you can't trust anyone then you're just not consuming like you're obviously trusting someone so like there's this weird you know gray space of a uh, of distrust and i just don't i don't know uh just if i could like you know put all the media and smush them into one entity i don't really know right. maybe right. maybe give them like a c plus or like a b minus something like that would you have ever considered being a journalist yeah um i would i think um my background puts me at kind of like a uh a bias and a, an odds that would affect future credibility for me just because I work in marketing. I mean, I'm like, I come from like a lot of the, the, the sort of left leaning uh, critique of media in general, like the sort of like the Noam Chomsky manufacturing mm -hmm. consent, like just the, mm -hmm. I'm not like, you know, an ideologue in that sense, but I do think there's a lot to be said about the, 
the sort of critique of, of mass media in general having like some you know unified propaganda kind of built subconsciously into the model so i don't think there's like a you know a clear black and white difference between journalism and marketing per se like the, the lines definitely blur especially in today's like online like the digital landscape but but that said i mean there is still um a, 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 a chasm, like a mass chasm between what i do to like directly you know profit you know an industry sales versus like a journalist who has like the integrity and the the impartiality to try to like uncover information like i I'm interested. I've done like I've written my own articles and done my own research for this type of thing, but I'm not sure how accepted my credentials would be moving into that industry. And if it was, I'm not sure how effective. Well, you can always you see. That's why we have social journalism. You can always come. That's my last plug. Uh, right. you, you're, okay. you're made for that. We're not. We're not scared of uh, of. Uh, we're not scared of challenging that line between journalism and advocacy too, mm -hmm. uh, and education. So, uh, Nathan, I want to thank you very, very much. I want to thank you for what you do because uh, you, you brighten days and you bring rationality into discussion that we desperately need. And I want to thank you for taking the time with me. I really appreciate it. No, thank you, Jeff. And sorry, I'm like, I, I, I tell people all the time, like the, these are such big questions and the answers, I know some people just want like direct sound bites, but like, it's just so complicated. You know, it's really hard no, that's to- what, uh, That's not what I wanted. I, that's what, okay, I, that's good. what I hope I would get. Because <laughs> so. I, I always feel like I could talk around these topics for hours and then you add almost too much nuance and not say anything, but man, it's, it is a, it's a complicated time we live in for all these institutions. So yeah. Amen, brother. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you.